As we resume our studies in 2 Corinthians by looking this morning at chapter 4 verses 1 to 6, I think perhaps it's quite important for me to just briefly uh, remind you of where we've come from uh, so far. We've learnt that Paul has been subject to severe criticism in the church in Corinth by people who'd come in from outside and claimed an authority over the Corinthian church which they, strictly speaking, did not have any right to. Uh, For a period of time, the Corinthian church was in real danger of being led astray by these false teachers uh, and to abandon the very person who had established and founded their church, who had been the one through whom they'd come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That they be duped into believing a gospel other than the gospel that the Apostle Paul uh, had preached. And that this would have jeopardised Paul's strategy, which was to uh, uh, preach in Corinth, to establish a congregation in Corinth, and then use Corinth as a base to evangelise out from Corinth uh, into the remainder of what we now know as Greece, and indeed to go, as he subsequently uses the phrase in his letter, to go to regions beyond. Now, Titus had recently visit, revisited the church at Corinth, and as a result of, of Titus's ministry, uh, the problems had been la- largely resolved, and Paul was now back in fellowship with the Corinthian church, and they with him. But, for, but Paul has found it necessary to write this particular letter in order to just tidy up one or two of the issues that remained or needed to be reinforced so that the Corinthian church might be protected in the future, and so that the relationship between Paul and the Corinthians be uh, further uh, founded effectively. Now, in the verses that I've just read to you, uh, Paul is writing with a real sense of discomfort. If you read through 2 Corinthians, a lot of what Paul says in this letter, he says with a great deal of reluctance, there are things he would far sooner not say. Especially, he would far, not, far sooner not speak about himself. But there are occasions he recognised when it is important to actually say things as they are and to speak uh, about uh, himself, though he does so with such hesitance and indeed with great humility. And he begins in the verses that we've just read together by contrasting his ministry to the ministry of his opponents. And in doing it, he sets out some principles that are abidingly relevant for us. What should our leaders look like? Not how should they be six foot one and whatever, but what should they be as people? What should their characters be like? Uh, And for those of us who are in leadership, what should our ambitions be? What should we expect of ourselves? Now the climax of this paragraph is verse 6, where Paul says, For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I can't read those words without thinking Paul is referring back to his conversion experience on the Damascus Road. God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Now for Paul that was very dramatic. We know the story. It's recorded uh, in the book of Acts on a number of occasions. None of us, I can be confident in saying this, None of us have had conversion experiences like the experience of the Apostle Paul. God deals with us all very differently. For some it is dramatic, like the Apostle Paul's conversion was dramatic. For others it's some, some, sometimes very much more imperceptible. But the principles of what the Apostle Paul says are true for each one of us. If we have been genuinely converted... It will, re- it will involve in us a recognition that whereas once we were spiritually blind, now we can see. There was a time when we didn't see things the way we now see them. 
There, is a, there was a time when we didn't see Jesus in the way that we see him now. Now we can speak of the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus. Then we were blind to that glory. And Paul says all this is down to the mercy of God. Verse 1, Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, uh, we do not lose heart. If we can now see, whereas once we were blind, if we now see the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus, whereas once he meant nothing to us, the reason we can now see is down to God's mercy. And if it's down to God's mercy, it's not down to us. Uh, and therefore it's a profoundly humbling thing that God should in his grace and his mercy look upon me and upon you and reveal the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ to you and to me is absolutely, utterly awesome. Humblingly awesome. Now, with that in mind, Paul then makes a number of points. And basically he says in verse 1, this has shaped my ministry. Since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Our lives ought to be shaped by our knowledge of God in, in the face of Christ Jesus. And our work should be shaped by that. And our ministry, my ministry, should be shaped by the knowledge of the grace of God in the face of Christ Jesus. And for Paul, the first thing he mentions is it gave him perseverance. Since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Might sometimes be very near to the point of losing heart, but at the end of the day, if we're called to the ministry that God has appointed us to, whether that be the pastor or whatever else it be in the church, then we do not lose heart because the ministry is not ours, it's his. And the grace and the mercy is his, not ours. And that gives perseverance. I've been in Christian ministry now long enough to know that, tragically, many people do fall by the wayside. Uh, they lose sight of whose ministry they're involved in. I have friends who were with me at Bible college who are no longer in Christian ministry. Some of them have even lost their faith. Uh, I, I have colleagues I've worked with who lost sight of the fact that the ministry was Christ Jesus's and took their own lives because they simply couldn't handle the pressure of ministry. I've known those who've evaded ministry by, uh, because of the pressures were such that they found ways out. The most easy way out for ministers is to commit adultery. And uh, I've known and seen that on a number of occasions. Uh, there are real pressures upon those of us who are called to ministry. And especially if we think the ministry is ours. But the ministry is not ours. We've received a ministry. And because we've received that ministry, we do not lose heart, or we should not lose heart. The second thing that Paul notes here is that as a result of knowing the grace of God that has shone uh, a light into his life and has been mercifully revealed to him. Therefore, he renounces the former ways of living. We have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception. Paul's ministry was out in the open. Now, as a church, we've been through difficult times in recent years. And we've known people who have done precisely what is described here. They'd engaged in secret and shameful ways to seek to destroy us. Some of you will be aware of uh, the fact that people would come and knock on your door and say, I've come round for a cup of tea, let's talk about Stephen and the leaders of the church. Or uh, done something similar. Now, don't you think it's about time we had changes in our church? And it was all done secretly, wasn't it? All done behind people's backs, trying to establish little power groups within uh, the fellowship here. Uh, and then there were those various attempts that were made to destroy the work here uh, by 
telling fibs to people in authority within our denomination. Unfortunately, the denomination decided to buy some of those stories. Uh, and uh, there was one occasion, you may not know this, most of you, there was one occasion on a Christmas five, five or six years ago when I was summoned to South End Central Police Station and I was subject to four hours questioning uh, under, under caution on allegations that if they'd have been true would have put me in prison for at least three years. Now that was the sort of strategies that were being taken to undermine us. Uh, that's not unusual. I've had a friend of mine this week just contact me to say uh, that exactly the same sort of strategies were used to him uh, as an Anglican priest. Uh, secret committees, worldly strategies, when eventually it became clear that uh, all the stories were not true, then, well, yes, secret committees convened and met without minutes to decide what they could do in order to uh, circumvent the problems that they'd created for themselves. Very early on, I was sharing with uh, Professor Packer what was happening here. And he said to me, Stephen, always stand in the light. And I've sought to do that. It's sometimes been very tempting not to, but I've sought to do that. And as the light has shone into the darkness, the darkness has actually had to run away. Because the light is more powerful than the darkness. But it's done so much damage along the way. And it was doing damage in Corinth. And therefore Paul has to expose the reality of, of the opposition that sometimes God's servants experience. And stand up and say without fear of contradiction, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception. He also notes that not only do they not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. One of the pressures that a Christian minister is always under is to shape his or her message uh, to the wishes of those to whom he or she is speaking. Uh, well, if I <coughs> preach that, so-and-so won't like it. Or if I say that, it will cause problems here or there. But actually we're called to be faithful. Faithful to the word of God. And Paul says he didn't seek favour with men or women. He sought favour with God. And he sought to be faithful to that which God had revealed. We must be sensitive to the fact that we need to uh, preach that message in the context of an ever-changing world. One of the challenges we, we will have to face as a congregation over these coming months will be to say, how do we do that? How do we remain faithful to the gospel as God has made it clear to us the unchanging gospel of Christ while at the same time recognising that the world we are in is changing and the way that we can best reach them uh, is different than it was once before. But, says Paul, when push comes to shove uh, it is not the message that changes, even if the message is unpopular. Indeed, he then goes on to say, it's not simply success we're after either. Even if the gos our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. You can imagine Paul's opponent saying, well, we, we can uh, build this church more effectively than, you, than your apostle did. We've got techniques that we can use that will enable us uh, to uh, really make you a successful church. And Paul says, we mustn't measure success by worldly standards. In fact, the point he makes here is that evangelistic success is impossible apart from the grace of God. Why? Because the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of God, who is the image of God. It's not our evangelistic strategies that ultimately are going to bring success or failure in the life of the church. It's the grace of God opening hearts to the truth 
People who are now blind being given spiritual sight as we were once given that sight. Now that's at the one, on the one hand concerning. Except for the grace of God we can't succeed. On the other hand, it's encouraging, isn't it? Because God has transformed us, he can transform others too. I always used to love reading bits of Wesley's journals when he gives his accounts of travelling to different parts of this country in his evangelistic strategy. Uh, And uh, every so often he, he would make a comment something like this. I'm going to preach at such and such a place. It is such a dark place. It is such a... Uh, an oppressed place. It is a place where people live blind to spiritual realities. Therefore, what better place for God to show his grace? What better place for God to show his grace in South End than in St Luke's Ward, one of the effectively most unevangelized parts of South End? What better place for God to show his glory in the face of Christ Jesus? Uh, and so, we don't despair. We prayerfully Uh, look to that day when God by his grace opens blind eyes enlarges stony hearts and reveals the glory of the grace of God in the face of Christ Jesus to them now it follows one final thing that Paul's ministry was not self-promoting we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. We, we mentioned Aruba earlier on in the service and the fact that one of the problems that uh, Christians in Aruba have is to be enticed by the teachings and the presentations of televangelists. You never see a televangelist looking anything other than absolutely spick and span. Got the smartest suit, uh, the, the, the newest fashion, uh, clearly surrounded by a host of people who are there to promote the televangelist. My daughter and son-in-law went to a church in New York just a few weeks ago uh, and you could buy t-shirts uh, which promoted the minister. $25. You can buy a t-shirt. Uh, we love Pastor Mike. It, it did occur to me that that might be a way of raising some funds here. Uh, but... Um, it also occurred to me that actually the Apostle Paul wouldn't be very pleased with that idea. And uh, Paul says he's not here to promote himself. He's not there to establish lordship. You know, one of the things that troubles me in the Christian church is the amount of people who are in it to gain power, to exercise power. They're not there to serve the church. They're there to dominate the church, whether it's at the local level or the national level or even the international level. Uh, They want to be known for, in the corridors of ecclesiastical power, for having clout. I couldn't care less whether I have that power. In fact, I would sooner I didn't ever find myself in that position. Happily, I can be fairly confident I won't. Uh, But but, uh, it's tragic, isn't it? And that's what Paul is seeking to set before us here. The nature of a genuine gospel, of a genuine gospel ministry. Now, this is the sort of ministry I've tried haltingly and imperfectly to live before you in the last ten years or so. Um, And it's tragically true that the opposition that we've often faced is by people who have actually demonstrated the opposite of what is Paul's model here. It's interesting, there's one little phrase, and with this I uh, conclude. Paul says in verse 2, On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. (coughs) At the end of the day, I hope that when my ministry ends, and of course, Christian ministry is a vocation, so it only ends at death. Uh, When that comes, uh, folk can say, he had his... He had his moments, but we believe his ministry is a ministry that is commended uh, before God, by God, because our consciences bear witness 
uh, to the fact that what he sought to do, he sought to do as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we sometimes find in preaching consecutively through the Scripture that we come across passages that frankly we would far sooner uh, take a detour around. Uh, And yet they're there. And they're there because you want us to learn from them. Help us and help me to be faithful to what we've shared today. For we ask it in the name of him of whom we have spoken, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.